Hi friends, welcome to this deep dive in which we talk about giving as a spiritual discipline. A number of months ago, when we came back from Israel at the end of February, and you think about it, that was almost nine months ago, and it feels like nine years ago, we were surprised to find that the grocery store shelves were empty. There were no household supplies anywhere to be found. Toilet paper especially was in demand. And it was apparent from the get-go that people were taking this coronavirus very seriously. They may not have known a lot about it. We didn't, in fact. But people were anxiously trying to prepare for an uncertain time, and they were stockpiling essential household supplies. How much toilet paper is enough? How much meat? How much bread? How much money is enough to have in your pantry or available at any, any given time? Walter Brueggemann, a theologian, describes our pre-pandemic culture, our pre-pandemic culture, as a society of 24-7 multitasking in order to achieve, accomplish, perform, and possess. We want more, have more, own more, use more, eat and drink more, he says, and the result is an endless pursuit that's always unsatisfied because we never have gotten or done enough. What is enough? Adam Hamilton asked that question in his study on stewardship in the Christian life. The temptation to become rich in things and poor in soul is always with us. Rich in things and poor in soul. This month's deep dive looks at the spiritual practice of giving and a deeper look uncovers a gazillion references in the scriptures to money and wealth and giving. We discover, for example, that Jesus didn't shy from the topic at all. You'll remember how he lumped together money, power, and possessions and, and called this mammon, reminding us also that we need to choose between God and mammon, that we can't be loyal. We can't observe as our highest priority both. We have to choose which one is our higher priority. How would you describe your relationship to God, to mammon? As we go back to the definition of discipleship, we're reminded that Christian discipleship is continuously and intentionally becoming more Christ-like and introducing others to Christ. Surely one of the characteristics that we see in Jesus is generosity. Jesus gave liberally of his time mentoring 12 disciples in faith for a period of three years living in community. He gave of his power, healing and feeding multitudes, sometimes thousands at once. He gave of his love, forgiving sins, befriending the friendless, and remember he gave his life, sacrificing everything for people who maybe didn't know him, much less love him. And we, like Jesus, are made in the image of God. And what do we find about God in the scriptures? God is the one described as extravagantly generous, providing rain for the just and the unjust, manna in the wilderness, and everything we need to sustain life and, and to enjoy community. Like God, we are people who thrive in community. Uh, we, we are people of relationships, family, friends, co-workers. These make us who we are. Generosity also is listed as one of the fruit of the Spirit. God is generous. And we see this in so many different ways. First century followers of Jesus also are described as generous. Listen to this quote from the second chapter of Acts. All who believed were together and had all things in common. 
They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, they ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. Generosity is a sign of spiritual maturity, a mark of discipleship. It's evidence of growing faith. It's been described too as an internal quality with external benefits, it's action in, in terms of what that quality will produce. And people who practice generosity know the joy of giving. There's a science to this. Giving produces in us a happy hormone called dopamine. Neuroscientists and theologians agree at this point. Doing good is indeed a good deal. Giving for the joy of it is reasonable, even if it sounds very unreasonable in a consumerist, materialistic kind of society. Charles Dickens' unforgettable character, Ebenezer Scrooge, discovered this key to happiness as well. Giving helped him to turn away from a life of self-absorbed greed towards joyful generosity. Glad and generous hearts undergird giving. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, preached about money a good deal. And in his oft-quoted sermon called The Use of Money, he went a little further and urged Christians to earn all they can, save all they can, and give all they can. And Wesley offers believers a healthier, more productive, more deeply Christ-centered life by providing practical wisdom on the relationship between their faith and finances. His intention was to guide these early Methodists in the spiritual discipline of generosity so that they'd become a giving people, you know, often and, and frequently and to the depths of their ability. And thus their lives would be shaped in the likeness of the extravagantly generous God we've already named. Followers of Christ practice generosity and find joy in giving. Well, in a similar vein, Paul encourages Timothy to teach his congregation to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, Paul says, they will build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. That's from his first letter to Timothy, the sixth chapter, 19th verse. Paul's call to extravagant generosity and Wesley's call to give all we can are about more than just writing an occasional check to the church or occasionally extending our uh, cashier uh, uh, the courtesy of the charitable gift rounding up to the next dollar and this is at the grocery store, by the way, I don't know if you go to the same store, but one of the things that we're asked rather frequently is if we would like to round up to the next dollar so that we can provide a gift to a particular organization. And they are wonderful, wonderful places to give. But it's important to realize that this kind of generosity and, and the stewardship that is a part of the practice we're describing is a reordering of financial priorities around our commitment to Christ. Jim Harnish is a retired United Methodist pastor and one who's written pretty extensively about the disciplines of our faith. And he says, this reordering includes a biblical vision of economic justice in which everyone shares in the abundant life God intends for all people. It's a call to economic practices by which we experience life that is truly life. And there he draws directly from Paul's words to Timothy. Wesley calls us to nothing less than using our money as the practical means by which we participate in God's kingdom coming on earth, even as it's already fulfilled in heaven. 
It's a way of embracing the love of God that walked among us in Jesus Christ and helping us to ensure that that love remains down to earth, a human reality in this world. You know, Wesley's credited along with many other Methodists, for establishing schools and hospitals and ministries and prisons and among the impoverished. And he practiced what he preached. He embraced giving as a way of life and a way of giving life. Harnish also makes a distinction that I think is really important for us to hear, especially in this season when we're distant from one another. He has written a book called Earn, Save, Give, and I bet you know where that title came from. And he makes a distinction between charitable giving and Christian stewardship. Charity, he says, is a compassionate, generous, and appropriate response to a specific need. For followers of Christ, it is a spiritual and practical expression of Jesus' love, and it's a beautiful thing to see. Stewardship is a different deal. It represents a radical reorientation of our whole life, including our finances, around a commitment to Christ. So he makes these comparisons. Charity can happen in a moment. Stewardship takes a lifetime. Charity may cause us to give out of our abundance. Stewardship changes the financial priorities by which we live. Effective charity is measured by the difference it makes for the ones who receive it. Stewardship is measured by the difference it makes in the life of the giver such important and deep, provocative distinctions. His use of the word stewardship reminds me of the work of Richard Foster. And he refers to stewardship as simplicity. Simplicity, choosing to live simply. And in fact, Foster says, simplicity is freedom. Duplicity is bondage. Simplicity brings joy and balance. Duplicity, on the other hand, brings anxiety and fear. He quotes the preacher of Ecclesiastes who said, God made man simple. Man's complex problems are of his own devising. Does that message from the Bible remind you of all the life lessons like all I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten and the collection of wisdom that gave us stop and smell the roses? Yes, Foster says the Christian discipline of simplicity is an inward reality that results in an outward lifestyle. Not different, really, from what was said about generosity, an inward quality with an external expression in action. We could expand Foster's thoughts in probably a dozen different directions, but his theological framework is absolutely crucial. He makes the claim that all that we have, life, relationships, time, uh, food, water, work, all are gifts from God. Now, it's interesting because most of us think that what we have, we've earned. We've worked hard to produce. We have accumulated on the backs of, of our own hard effort. Well, I think Foster's position is a little different and maybe more rooted in scripture. Instead, he says, God assigned the management of all of God's gifts to us. We're the managers, God is the owner. Time is probably one of the best examples we could use to understand this framework. We often talk about spending time. We've made time a commodity in our society. And 
maybe the pandemic has softened that a little. Maybe we've adjusted our expectations a little. But as we think about spending time, we place a value, and it may be the value of what we can earn in a, an hour. It may be any number of ways that we define that. But time has become a commodity that we seem to feel we own and we can, at our judgment, our, our decision, uh, distribute as we choose. Well, in fact, everyone has been given the same number of hours in a day, the same number of days in a week. Time is given equitably among all people. And God then assigned the management of that time to us, the creatures, at this point in time. So if we accept that all of our wealth belongs to God and understand that our role is a role of using that wealth to meet God's purposes. We understand how redistributing those resources for the well being of others is the calling on our lives. It's a matter of economic justice, as Jim Harnish has pointed out. Every financial decision is a spiritual decision. Every financial decision is a matter of trusting God that you are enough, you have enough, it is enough. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? God owns, we manage. It has been said, and I know you've heard it too, that we suffer from affluenza. The confluence of two words, affluence, and influenza give us that cultural disease that we call affluenza. Now there is a vaccine that is highly effective in preventing affluenza and it's called faith. Faith in an extravagantly generous God, faith in Jesus Christ, God's son, who calls us to follow, Faith that in following Jesus, we will share God's abundance where justice and mercy are in short supply. Faith that in giving, we experience joy. A final thought that I wanna share with you is this. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your generosity. You know, it doesn't matter whether you give liberally enough to create an endowment or to provide for a person's lifetime need. We try to do that for our children. It doesn't matter the amount. Surely in Jesus' observance of the widow who gave the last mite she had, this was an important part of the message. It's not about the amount. It's about the generosity of the heart and the intentional and continuous effort to become more like Jesus. And we become more like Jesus as we try to live like Jesus, as we are close enough to Jesus to fully embody the things that were important to him. So I thank you and recognize with gratitude your generosity and the difference you make in others' lives. Giving to your church is not about budgets and buildings and salaries and stuff. It's about sharing your gifts with a collective and demonstrating the love of Christ for people in the margins. And I've seen your generosity toward the men and women at Link. I've seen your generosity toward the children at Snipes Academy and your generosity toward the children and families who are connected to the Methodist Homes for Children. And I could go on and on and on. I just want to say one thing. In this pandemic, your gifts are needed more than ever. The church has relied for many years on special events to raise funds for missions. And this year, the fundraisers just can't be held in the same way that they have been in the past. And mission dollars likely will be stretched as never before. I don't know about you, but after months of being almost homebound, I don't need any new clothes. I haven't worn out the ones that are in the closet. I don't need to shop because it's risky to my health anyway. It just adds stuff I don't really need. 
And I know we have a lot of complicated issues in our country, but accumulating more stuff won't solve them. Giving to the church or through the church will bring me more joy and will benefit more people and will reflect the light of Jesus more than my spending on stuff. So thank you, good, generous, giving friends. And know that your gifts are multiplied and are used to build up the kingdom that Jesus has already come to announce. Be faithful. Love you.